Hello, and live from Denver, it is Friday night. Let us, yep, we are great. Hey, everybody, welcome to Critical Conversations, the weekly show where you get to talk to us, and us, of course, being me and my beautiful wife, Melissa. Hello. Uh, definitely the showrunner and head of all things that go on in the household here. <laughs> I don't know about that, but okay. I mean, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. And, uh, of course, the <sighs> love of my life. You baby, me too. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> there we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to see you all in the chat. Uh, hello, Pennsylvania. Hello, Washington. Um, all doing good. Hey, Henny. Hey, everybody. All right. Boy, what a week, huh? <laughs> wow. What a week we had. Um, we had some interesting news with uh, Laura Preppen. Prepon, 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 prepo. I, you know, I don't know. I, I I'm just gonna say Laura Preppen. Uh, if I'm Prepone? wrong, you know, I mispronounced Leah's name for a while too. I think I was calling her Remini or something. Or anyway, uh, so if I am butchering her name, it is all 100% my bad. But we will be discussing and talking about her departure from Scientology. I thought I'd open it up to talk about Scientology for the whole episode this time, this week, right? And see where we go, see where that takes us. Um, there is, of course, a lot to talk about with that subject. It's, it's big and wide, and I've had my nose deep into it this week. I've been, um, I don't know, I've never really talked about this, but I have a... Um, I have a, oh, hey, thanks, Preacher. Thank you very much yeah. for that super chat. Very nice. Um, I have a, a very extensive digital library of Scientology materials that I've collected over the last many years. When I left Scientology, I did not leave with all my stuff. In fact, I didn't even have a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, it's not like getting paid as a Sea Org member is the way to collect all of Hubbard's materials. They charge you the same as they charge the public to buy the stuff. So if I wanted Hubbard's lectures and books, I had to pay for them. And why would I do that when I'm on a Sea Org base where they are all in abundance there? All the lectures, all the books, everything that's released, it's all there on the base. And I live there for, you know, over a decade. So why would I amass a personal library of it too? Well, when I got out and uh, really, and I got out, got out, like I'm out of Scientology, then of course the last thing I wanted was to have any of Hubbard's materials around. Because <laughs> um, I had no idea at the beginning that I was going to end up, you know, uh, making a, a, a career and, and uh, building a life yeah. around talking about this stuff. But uh, yeah, exactly. Everybody throws their, their stuff away, XI in there. And, um, oh, yeah, Teresa, yeah, Laura Preppen, quit Scientology. Yeah, there's yeah. news on that this week. So, okay, so um, so I've been amassing this digital collection, but it's been haphazard. It's been disorganized. It's I've, I've got stuff in folders here, folders there. I've scanned a bunch of stuff that, uh, you know, that of catching back up on some of the newer materials. And um, people have sent me stuff, and then I've, I've scanned it and sent it back, and and I've got a pretty good, pretty good collection now, but I'm having to go through that because part of my um, thesis, part of my master's thesis for this, which is the, the stage that I'm now in, is I'm going to be analyzing uh, Hubbard's, some of Hubbard's lectures, uh, specifically around the, the subject of security checking or confessionals. And I'm writing a paper about confessionals in history and in Catholicism and in Scientology. And no one's ever written that paper. No one's ever. They, there have been four or five papers written by academics about the RPF, and I'm going to be going into those as uh, as part of the part of my study of this, part of the lit, lit, literature review <laughs> for those of you who know about that stuff. Um, and uh, but those papers were all mostly uh, uh, paid for by Scientology. Those are apologist papers. Those are papers by scholars who think that Scientology is great and the RPF is no big deal. And uh, the RPF is just this voluntary program that people do. And what's the problem? And, you know, they and and other groups have rehabilitation programs. So, you know, no big deal. Well, as somebody who's done the RPF, I have a few other things to say about that. And so, um, but this paper that I'm going to be writing isn't going to deal with the RPF, except for the fact that the RPF has sec checking on it. It's a sec checking program. So that'll feature in 
uh, my paper to to one degree or another. But mostly, it's going to be kind of breaking down from a from an academic point of view the 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 use of confessionals or confession as a method of coercive control. And and for those of you who've been watching me for a long time, you know that. That this guy Robert Lifton wrote a book called Psycholo "The Psychology of uh, Totalism," or total. Anyway, I uh, wrote a book about. <laughs> I love it when I'm always on the spot and I miss and I misstate <laughs> what the things are. Right, um, thought reform and the psychology of totalism is the name of his mm. book, and in it he lists um, eight points of thought reform or brainwashing or mind control, and confession is one of them. Uh, getting enforcing confessions, you know, we saw this uh, with Russians and the, you know, with with captured uh, POWs forced to confess to things. Uh, other countries have done this as a propaganda technique, and uh, and this was studied, and this is definitely one of the ways that you can mess with people's heads is enforce confessions, force people to not have any sense of privacy, dignity, or individuality. And um, and that's that's part of how that can become a, a bad thing. The Catholics do it, but they don't do it to the extreme that Scientology does it, right? right? I mean, everybody right. knows about Catholic guilt, and you know that that that, that there's a that the guilt is, is a thing there, but um, but not but Scientology takes it to a whole nother level, and yeah. that's what I'll be writing about and talking about. Hey, R. R. Smith, awesome! Thank you for that super chat and. Um, Yes, I do plan on um, public putting my um, my thesis on my website after I uh, after I publish or after I get it uh, turned in. Um, then yes, I will put it up for people to see. Uh, that that will be done. I don't know that I'm going to do that with the essays that I wrote. Um, I could. I just don't know if anybody would really find them very interesting or useful. <laughs> They're just so dry. They're so dry. They're so academic, you know. I'm not. I'm just not sure that anybody would be super interested. But I. But the thesis, the the, this I'm. This I want to do. I'm trying to, and you guys can let me know. I'm trying to take pains to not call it a dissertation. They call it a dissertation in the UK system, but over here that tends to be more something that's re, that's used for a doctorate. You do a dissertation when you do a doctorate, and I'm not doing a doctorate. I'm doing a master's. So. So I'm 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 taking pains to keep calling it a thesis, but I don't know. You guys can let me know if uh, if I'm off the rails on that. Well, there's always little different things. You know how they call high school, college, and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the U the UK system is interestingly different. Mm -hmm. uh, I like it uh, personally. I like the at least at this level at the at the post grad level. I I like it. I couldn't speak to the earlier levels and i'm certainly not for the eaton collar and the and the and the old school tie i'm not i'm not into <laughs> that whole thing i think that's all for the birds but uh okay yeah exactly um okay cool so so we'll see where we go with all of that so um hey baby how was your week pretty good i just uh i it's been a busy week for me went out a few times um yeah Cause what did we do? We had friends over on Monday, mm -hmm. we cooked dinner. They seemed to like it unless they were lying. I don't know. She cooked. <laughs> she cooks good stuff sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and Wednesday we went to book club and that was fun. That was, and uh, that's a fun meetup group. That was the same meetup group I went to last week at the Denver Botanic Garden. So nice. I, I like them. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Getting out, <laughs> getting out. Yeah. Getting out. Been working. Excellent. And um, let us um, check in with Seven. Yeah. Boom. Aww. There he is. There's He's our little. snoozing like he does. That's right. Our little bundle of desk. furry love. <laughs> yeah. Mel got the Seven Cam this week. This was uh, this was him chilling on her desk there, right, where she was working, uh, which was awesome. Yeah. He likes in the afternoon, he'll come nap up there. Aw. <laughs> Our little child. That's yeah, kind of... the closest thing we'll ever have to a kid. That's right. Ba <laughs> basically, that's that's kind of true. I'm going to... I actually just realized I'm. we're off, oh. off center a little bit over here. You're, you're good. I'm oh, just, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. All right. So, anyway. Okay. So, yes. OT7. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, 
Have I watched Jeopardy at all recently? No, mm. I have not watched Jeopardy at all recently. I did comment this morning on what I thought was a um, really stupid reason why the guy who was going to end up being the host, uh, this Michael J Jackson, John, whatever, I, this guy, he was the, he was a producer of the show, and I guess he was named to be a host. And then uh, something came up from a podcast from 10 years ago. Oh, no. Did he get canceled? Yeah. He got kicked. He got. He had to uh, turn in. He resigned. You know. No, I won't be the host. Okay. What I'm. Did he I, you say? know. My bad. I. I have to learn how. What a horrible person I am because I said, you know, things that I thought were funny ten years ago, and now nobody thinks they're funny. What was it? It was some. It was some something to do with. Well, I, I didn't actually find the quote. Oh, okay. I couldn't find it. Maybe uh, it was just it's gone now. Yeah. Had to do with women or misogyny or something and <laughs> Semitism. I don't know. Um. But, oh, good, 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 good. It's just seeing your note here, Christina. Um, anyway, yeah, I like Jeopardy, and I didn't like the reason that that guy, I, I didn't even know him. I don't know this guy. I know nothing about I him. Know, I just don't like cancel culture, and I don't like the way it's baked into our society where people are like, yay, without even knowing the facts. It's just, oh, he said something bad. Well, screw him, because I actually wanted LeVar Burton to be the host. So, you know, screw that guy. And that's basically what I sort of was 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 seeing on Twitter. So I was just, uh, yeah, trust us, it was uh, definitely bad enough. I mean, I don't know what bad enough is supposed know. to be. That's yeah. my point. You guys might or might not think about this um, when I bring up stuff like this. But let me let me I think about it. So let me tell you. If you guys heard the things that came out of my mouth. 10 years ago. I mean, because I haven't even been out of Scientology 10 years. So 10 years ago, I was still a hardcore Sea Org member. And if you guys heard the shit that came out of my mouth, I, you would not like me very much <laughs> then. And good, fine. You know, don't like me then, right? But I'm, a, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not that person anymore. So if you hold me accountable now for the things that I said 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they were horrible things that I said about people, about gays, about especially the LGBT, LGBT community, um, I was horribly and uh, homophobic, mm -hmm. right? And um, I also was deep down the conspiracy well. And I said anti-Semitic things, and I said I, I said some nasty stuff, you know, in terms of spreading this this conspiracy nonsense. I regret all of that. It's not like I'm proud of that. But if you guys, you know, well, Chris, we're not going to watch your show anymore because of that crap you said 15 years ago. I'd be like, well, yeah, but that's not who I am now. Yeah. So okay, I mean, I guess it's your right to do, you know, watch whatever you want, but. You know, I'm I'm not that person anymore, and I and I don't think any of us are. I mean, if you're the same person you were ten years ago, I feel very sorry for you because life should be a a, a growth and change mm -hmm. and evolution. You know, hopefully in a good direction. But you know, I don't think any of us are the same person, and so to hold us, you know, to hold our careers hostage to something like that. I, you know, yeah, now you have to guess what the future will be and how people will be sensitive in the future about the thing you're talking about now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's <What>? just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Much less you go back 20, 30 years ago. And this, and this oh is gosh. most, of course, this is most rampant. Since we're talking about this, I'm just going to go on a little bit of a thing about it for a second. Um, it's most prevalent in comedy and comedy by definition is at the edge, the bleeding edge of society, pushing boundaries, pushing the envelope, saying things that, that everybody knows aren't right, aren't true, but we're going to laugh at it because of the shock or surprise. And you don't even have to be uh, you know, an Andrew Dice Clay. I don't mean a shock, that kind of shock value, but you know, any kind of comedy that's good comedy is going to be observational. It's going to be pointing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be digging. It's going to be showing and lampooning the ridiculous things in society. And there's always ridiculous things in society to lampoon. But people can get sensitive about that stuff after a few years. And it's just a little weird how sensitive people get about it. That's, that's my take. 
So anyway, yeah. you know, neo-Nazis are not giving a pass to, and let's not, you know, no. let's not go off into saying, you know, something I'm not no. saying. Obviously, bad <laughs> people are bad, and we don't want to promote the values of bad people. So fine, don't do that. But when people have changed, when people are not bad people, but they yeah, say... grown and changed and learned and... Exactly. Say stuff that, you know, they go, okay, well, uh, yeah, that was wrong then, but I'm not that person now. Then why can't we just acknowledge that and move on? Why do we have to destroy their career? I don't understand that. I think that it's actually, frankly, I think it's a little culty. So that's... Anyway, that's my hot take on that, now that I've alienated some people. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you guys for your supportive comments, too, by the way, though. I don't mean to, you know. Yeah, it's just, I, I do think that there is a certain group of people who have discovered that there is power in being offended. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's the basis of power. You know, uh, you, your, your reaction to what I have to say shouldn't give you the right to dictate my life. If, if you don't like what I have to say, then just don't listen to me. But that's a, you, you, anyway, you can see how the, the thing gets all out of whack. So that all being said, we got a call in the queue and let's go ahead and pick it up real fast here because I've had him on hold longer than I wanted. Hello, Mark. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, that uh, the, the the other guy um, that's fighting for Carolina City Council. I keep getting his name. Aaron. Um. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, I keep wondering what since if he gets elected. I wonder. I wonder uh, what Scientology's uh, reaction is going to be to that. To have two, uh, um, two anti Scientology people on the city council. Yeah, they're going to hate it. Uh, they're going to hate it. They're going to be very, very mad. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a surety that Aaron will get elected, but if he does, Scientology is going to be very upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, nothing about Scientology is that despite all the bad, bad press and all the bad videos of Scientology, Scientologists just seem to just ignore it and ignore all that and keep saying, "Oh, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with us," despite the overwhelming evidence. Exactly. Well, that's the thing about cults is they have to lie all the time about, you know, what they're up to and, and what they're doing. And they just, and all they can do is say, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying, or try to do what Scientology does where they just engage in character assassination. And they just want to, you know, shut the person up by trying to cancel them, basically, <laughs> actually, is exactly mm -hmm. what they're trying to do. And, uh, and, and people yeah. are smart now about when Scientology is doing that, that means that the person that's try that they're trying to cancel is probably a good person. <laughs> so they've kind of worn that out now, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, and uh, in this, this Peterson case, do you get any update how it's come along? Uh, you mean the Masterson case? Yeah. Yeah, no, there is no update yet. It is uh, pushed forward until next year. Um, I, 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 think, I think March, if I remember right, but don't quote me on that, um, for when, it's actually, when the trial is actually going to begin. It was, it was scheduled for November, and I believe something delayed it and pushed it forward, which was predicted for. I mean, Tony was saying that, Odds are it's not going to happen till next year, and I think he's right. Okay. Yeah, but otherwise we're but this this show we will talk about Laura Prepon because I think she's not connected to the case, but you know she is connected to Danny Masterson, so we will talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I I just heard about her just um, just yesterday. So yeah. I really don't know uh, too much about it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Well, we're going to talk about that now. So we'll just go ahead and get okay. to it. Okay. Cool, man. Thanks right. for calling in, Mark. Okay. Bye-bye. All, right, All right. And I see another caller in the queue right now. Uh, let's go ahead and pick this up 
uh, because this is a call-in show, by the way. So when I get calls in the queue, I do want to get onto them. 984-214-4154 is the number. So this is uh, Ken, I believe. Hello. Hi. Hey, Ken. Yeah, what's up? Welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, Melissa, Seven. It's good to talk to you guys again. Uh, I'm going to make mine real, real quick, and that way you can get on with the rest of the show. All and, right, what you got? Um, is Laura Prepon, uh, is there a chance she's going to get declared by Scientology, or do you think they might go, uh, I don't know, that might be bad PR if we do it, so maybe we'll just try to ignore it. Any thoughts on that? Or Yeah, um, she's a celebrity, so the rules are always put aside for celebs. They're always the exceptions to the rules that we talk about, but she's out, and she's publicly stated that she's out. And when you do that, that is a specific High crime, Mm -hmm. which means it's a suppressive act. High crime and suppressive act are the same thing in Scientology. So when you commit suppressive acts, the church is obligated to investigate and declare you suppressive. (laughs) So odds are she has already been or will be declared. However, that's not a process they share with the public. So it may or may not have already happened. And even if it did happen, they may or may not share that with Scientologists. Something that that some that people might not know is that just because you get declared doesn't mean everybody in Scientology finds out about it. Oh. It used to be that everybody found out about it because they would post the declare order on a notice board and they'd send them around to the orgs and post this up on a notice board. But with somebody like Laura Prepon, I don't think they're going to be eager to do that. I think they're going to be more eager to try to encourage Scientologists to not find out about it or know about it or just sort of not talk about it, you know, as opposed to make a big stink about it. Because she's pretty famous, you know, and it it hurts when they have a celeb Mm -hmm. go out, you know. Oh, yeah, I I know that. I was just wondering, though, uh, obviously she has to be aware that this is a very big possibility they may declare or something. Yes. But do you think she just doesn't give a shit at this point or is just too toxic to stay? Maybe a bunch of different reasons? Or Well, that's probably what we're going to talk about in the show here. But I think that um, I think that she's out. I think she's been out. I don't think that she cares at all what the church has to say about her at this point. I think that the making a public statement about it is basically that as a, as a Scientologist and certainly as a celebrity Scientologist, you know, you know, that silence is power, that there's a power to that. You have options, you have things, you know, there's your silence is a tool you have. And so is speaking out. So as soon as you say anything, people are going to jump all over it as they have done. And I think she knew that. I don't think she's so media unaware that she, you know, thought that this was just going to fly by and nobody was going to notice. So, um, so I think she, I think it was a calculated move on her part, which means that she is completely out. Yeah, that that makes sense. The only last thing I'm going to say is uh, somehow this is all I'm going to I'm going to take a guess. I don't think she's going to be getting any Christmas cards from the master. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys got a bunch of other stuff to talk about. I just want to listen to the rest of the show. So awesome. Uh, well, thanks for calling in. Yeah. Bye, bye, guys. All right. Bye, bye. Bye. My pleasure. Anytime. Bye, bye. All right. Good. So, um, fair enough there. So let's, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about this. How are we doing on the uh, in the comments here? I'm pretty good. Um, someone wants to know if Scientology or the Taliban is worse. I think that's. The Taliban is worse. <laughs> the The Taliban kills people. Yeah. Uh, straight up. They'll just shoot you uh, if they don't like what you are doing. And they are, I understand right now, and, and if certainly in the past, you know, they're going door to door right now. They're looking for sympathizers, allies, Western allies, et cetera. I mean, these are, these are bad people. Uh, awful. So they're I don't know. Bad. I don't know if that's a joke question, but I, I'm answering it seriously. That's, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's, yeah. The Taliban is definitely worse than Scientology. So, I mean, I suppose it, it depends on your values. I mean, if you value money more than life, you know, then I suppose Scientology is worse. But uh, no, nah, it's it, it's pretty bad. But what I find interesting, actually, and what I'll comment on here real fast, is that the methods of control 
and the things that go on um, in the heads of the people in the Taliban and the heads of Scientologists is remarkably startlingly similar. Um, and that's weird. That's really weird because the ideologies are so different. The geog ge geography is different. The, the methodologies are different. But the extremism, the, the extremity of the belief set and the willingness to engage in extreme acts because of that belief set is what they have in common. And it's a lot more in common um, than you might imagine. I mean, the headspace of a Scientologist is a, is a pretty nutty place. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, I, I, you spend years getting out of it and then you really sit down one day, you have a dream or you have a, you know, like a really livid memory of like what it really used to be like when, you know, when you were a Sea Org member or a Scientologist, it's like, God damn, did I really used to think that way? It, it, yeah, I, you know, I really did. So it's wild how, how crazy that headspace can get worth, uh, worth commenting on. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I wish Christopher Masterson would get out, too. I wish all of them would. Um, okay, so let's talk about Laura. So I, um, I did a little digging, just a little bit, okay? Very cursory. Um, if you don't know, or if you haven't heard, Laura Prepon, who was an actress on Orange is the New Black and that 70s show, and she's been on various other shows, um said this week in a People magazine article that she, that Scientology is no longer part of her life and that she hasn't practiced it in five years. That's that's basically the statement. And there's not a whole lot more to the release than that. There, there She did not, you know, she was not gushing with information and the reporter didn't really dig or get into that mm -hmm. because I don't think that was the thrust or the primary purpose for the story. Laura is... Um, now engaged in uh, creating cookbooks and doing a cookware line, and she's doing um, you know some uh, acting work, but she's really focused on her two kids. And um, and her first child, Ella, was born in 2016, and then she married Ben Foster, the father, and then they had another kid, and I think it was 2018 or 19, and. Um, and now she's, and she's been, if you, if you do a Google search for her name or, or just look at what she's been up to prior to this week, it's cookware, it's cookbooks, it's, it's shows that she's been on, you know, this show, that show, but not a series. She hasn't had a new series since, um, leaving, um, Orange is the New Black. Or, yeah, there was actually, there was another series oh, that okay. there was, that went for two seasons. There's something road or something. And uh, I think that was about it. But she's really focused on family. And that's what she's putting out, is that she is very focused on her family, the whole um, pandemic and stuff. She was like, you know, sheltering in and decided that she would pursue this line of, of, of cooking stuff. I'm wondering, because you said five years ago is when she left, and five yep. years ago is when the baby came. Yeah. Funny that. Yeah. Well, on that line, I dug up this quote. And I wanted to throw this out there. Now, um, you know, we're going to conjecture because that's the nature of people and what we're going to do, right? But we really need her to get interviewed at length about this. And she needs to open up more about it. And she may or may not choose to do that. Um, you know, her. some people do what I do, uh, do what Leah did, right? We, we're like same, same in terms of we got out and we kind of realized how, how screwed it was. And we went, oh my God, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. We gotta talk about this. Uh, I don't know that Laura ever got past the state up, even up to the state of clear or past it, much less to the OT levels. So I don't know that she ever really even got her eyes on you know, the really crazy stuff of Scientology, which is the OT levels. I don't, I, I didn't see any evidence that she ever got there. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that's what I, that's what I saw. Her last success story, the last thing she, she put out in a Scientology publication six years ago was a success story and talk about new era Dianetics, which is the step that you do right before clear. So it's up there, but it's not OT level up there. And, um, and then, you know, she says, well, five years ago, she stopped being involved. So I dug this up 
and I wanted to go over it with you because this was something that she said. Uh, it's an interview on Yahoo News, May 7th, 2021. So this is from this year. And she was asked, oh yeah, she wrote a book called You and I as Mothers. And she talked about mothering and, be and being a mother. And she goes into her personal life, her relationship with her mom and, and, and the kid, and the fact that she um, had to terminate a pregnancy that she mm. had when she was on um, the Orange is the New Black. She was, I think, two-thirds along. Oh, wow. Yeah. And something came up with the health of the kid, and mm. it wasn't going to gonna survive the pregnancy. And, you know, there's, there is just no rougher decision than having to terminate a pregnancy that you don't want to terminate. Yeah. I just can't think of anything more devastating to a woman than to do something than than to have that happen to her. I, I can't even imagine. Mm -mm. I, I really can't. I, mm -mm. I can sort of get an idea, but I just can't imagine what that would be like. She lived through that and she talked about that and and various other things. So she so here's this uh question. Your book, You and I as Mothers, talks about the idea of becoming a mom without losing yourself in the process. How do you be Laura, and how do you be Mom Laura, and how are they different? And here's what she said, and, and this only has a lot more sort of weight to it in light of this other revelation that she's not doing Scientology anymore. And I thought this was interesting, and nobody's brought this up yet. She, she said, I'm not who I was, and by the way, would never go back. When I became a mother, I woke up. I really feel like I woke up when I gave birth to my daughter, and I heard her first little squawk. It tore through me, and I was born. I was born just like she was, and I was never going to go back to who I was before that. There was a period of mourning that former self, but you also become this completely different person in so many ways. It's embracing that. It's the biggest gift and blessing you can ever imagine, and it's also the biggest reckoning. It's this dual juggle that you're having to figure out. And even now, as a mother of two, I'm still trying to figure out how do you balance work with being a mom and being a present partner. It's a constant evolution. When you have a kid, it's like your heart is outside of your body and you want to wrap them in protective wrap and make sure that nothing ever touches them. And now I have two, so I have two hearts outside of my body. So, you know, powerful stuff and certainly a good statement about, you know, the power of motherhood and the change that that, you know, wrought. Um, but when we put that in light to the Scientology yeah, reveal. It's interesting. Little maybe she got pregnant and started thinking. Well, maybe so. Right? Something changed. Something mm -hmm. huge changed with her. And she is saying before the Scientology reveal that motherhood was that thing. Mm -hmm. And it was big for her. It was huge. And she completely changed. So you know, what does that mean? Well, we can infer lots of things. So let's go ahead and start doing that. <laughs> um, okay, so first off, we have her past with um, Masterson. Okay, we're going to bring Masterson into this because there is a potential here that it's just this big coincidence that she reveals that she's no longer a Scientologist on the eve of Masterson you know, getting busted and going into a criminal trial for multiple rape, right? That's that's pretty bad. And and she's intimately connected with the Masterson family because she dated Christopher Masterson, Danny's brother, for years. Up until I think ninety eight to two thousand six or seven, they wow. were dating. That's a long term yeah. relationship. I don't know that she could have been any more intimately connected with the Masterson family than that. So she knows all about the Mastersons inside and out. Now, you know, whether she knows about his crimes or what she thinks about them, we have no idea. So I'm not necessarily going to conjecture on that. I have no idea what her moral compass is or, or where she comes from on that. But, um, but she did stop dating Christopher Masterson in 2006 or 7, and 
this happens to be uh, around the time period in the in the window of time where the church is actively covering up the allegations of these women coming forward and and saying that Danny Masterson raped them, and um, you know it would not it would be one thousand percent probable. In other words, I'm saying it's a dead certainty that all of Masterson's connections, his celebrity connections, his family, all of them who are Scientologists, and Laura was a Scientologist back then, would have also been interviewed, wrangled up, somehow talked to, somehow, you know, communicated with about this situation, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's no way that she, I don't think, I mean, there is, there are ways it's possible that she never heard anything about the accusations, didn't know anything about Masterson's legal troubles or, or these problems, but I doubt it because Masterson's not a quiet guy. His uh, family is very, you know, and he himself is a wild child. I mean, he used to go by the name DJ Donkey Punch. Uh, you can yeah. look up Donkey Punch if you yeah, want. but we won't explain it exactly. Yeah, that's, that, <laughs> that's who Masterson is. Uh, he, you know, he prided himself on that. It was only after the sexual assaults that the, I believe the church insisted he changed that name because he dropped it. Um, so uh, she's in that world at that time. And she skips out of that world because she stops dating Chris. But I don't know that that means that she's no longer friends with all these people. I mean, this is the cast of the 70s show. I mean, half of them are, you know, some of them are Scientologists. I believe she got into Scientology through the 70s show. If at least timing wise, that's yeah. when she she got involved. So um, so it's not, you know, super hard to connect some dots here that she might know something about that. And um you know, I don't want to over conjecture on this, right? I don't want to. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth by saying that. Well, of course she knew. I I don't know if she did or not, and neither do you. <laughs> but we sure need her to come forward and start talking about what she did and didn't know, because this is kind of important to a lot of people, including mm-hmm. Danny Masterson's victims. Yeah. This is not just celebrity TMZ stuff. I'm trying to talk. I'm I'm coming at this from my interest in this is I am fascinated by the fact she hasn't done Scientology in five years, and that she now is coming out on it. And the timing points right to the Masterson case because what else would there be uh, as to why to publicly say I'm no longer a Scientologist? That is a suppressive act, and she will get declared for mm-hmm. that. Or at least she could get declared for that. And she wouldn't know any better than, of course, she would, would know or think, I'm going to get declared mm-hmm. for this. I mean, that would be, any Scientologist would think that. It would be weird if the church didn't declare her over that because it's a high crime. Uh, okay, so I think, I happen to think that there's a number of people in that crowd, in those in the celebrity friend circle, the, the Ashton Kutcher, Danny Masterson circle, which uh, included her and other people on the 70s show and, and other people in that crowd, other Masterson uh, family members, Alana Masterson, etc. I happen to think that whole crowd is sort of not really with it, Scientology-wise. I, I think a lot of them are just sort of Scientologists in name only, or they're there because they would get disconnected from their family, right? Because remember that the Mastersons is not just Danny and Chris who are Scientologists. It's the whole family. It's his parents. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, stepdad. It's, it's uh, f- anyway, it's, it's a, it's, there's layers to it. It's, it's not even, it's a little complicated of a, uh, of a family thing, but they're all Scientologists. So, um, but Scientologist in name only. I mean, Danny Masterson himself, not a hardcore Scientologist. He was constantly in ethics trouble. Uh, I, I saw reports myself when I was a Sea Org member on him and what an out ethics, quote unquote, lifestyle he led because he was partier and he was a drinker and he would do drugs and he was just kind of uh, unapologetic about it. And then he'd have to come in and make amends and get apologetic about it and then go out and do it again. So he was constantly getting wrangled in for this kind of stuff. And then, of course, we find out years later, you know, there's the whole sexual assault thing. So um, so he's not really 
much of a Scientologist. I don't think he's even clear. I think he's gotten up to the level of like grade two or something. That's nothing. So, I mean, especially for a celebrity who's yeah. got money and got the time to be able to, to do Scientology. If he wanted to be OT8, you know, he could have been. Um, but he wasn't. He was a partier. And he, just, and he thought that lifestyle was, was, uh, was the thing that he should do. So I think that she, Laura, just distanced herself from that, right? Um, maybe slowly, maybe quickly. Kind of hard to say. Not really sure what the indications on that are. But, um, but then in, she gives this success story in 2015 about, you know, this interview for the Celebrity magazine. And Celebrity is a Scientology publication I'm referring to here where she's quoted as saying that, you know, new aerodynetics was this wonderful stuff and it was really changing her life. But then a year later, she's not practicing it anymore. So it's possible that she was either recovered or that was the place where she was out on the bridge. And then motherhood happens. And apparently it changed her in a very, very significant way. Maybe she started, and there's a lot of conjecture here. I mean, maybe she started thinking about what Scientology would be like with her kids and didn't like that. Maybe there was some kind of other reveal that came across her plate about Masterson or about something else with Scientology. Maybe she watched Going Clear, you know? <laughs> Uh, and read a book or something. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, beyond the realm of possibility that she got a little educated on the topic and decided, well, this is for the birds, especially if you consider that not only did she become a mother, but she came, became a mother with Ben Foster. And Ben Foster grew up in a cult of his own. And I am having a hard time remembering exactly which one it was. Um... Can you check that real fast? Yeah. Can you just look at Ben Foster yeah. childhood cult and see if there's something there? Because he he's had cult experience. And I think that he also was very likely an influence on her coming out. They weren't married when the first when their first child was born, Ella, but they um, did get married after Ella was born. And I think that was a clearly a commitment in his direction. And I don't think he was on board with Scientology. You know, I read a couple of years ago an interview with him where he talked about uh, yeah, smoking pot. I think he, I think, if I remember right, and I could be wrong on this, I think he talked about ayahuasca or something too, like doing some pretty heavy stuff. And I thought there is 0% chance, after reading that interview, I thought there is 0% chance this guy is a Scientologist. There is no way because not one single Scientologist is ever, ever going to publicly promote the use of drugs, uh, you know, hallucinogenics or otherwise. There's just no way that's ever going to happen. Scientology is rabidly anti-drug. L. Ron Hubbard was extremely clear about this. He didn't necessarily follow his own advice, but he was very clear and scientology has it's one of their foundational tenets is that thou shalt not do drugs just period end of story pot unacceptable hallucinogenics absolutely out of bounds so for him to say in a in a in a public interview you know oh yeah i was i was doing drugs yeah i was like nope this guy's not a scientologist and i wondered I wonder what he's doing to influence Laura. Wouldn't it be cool if Laura got out, right? But it was just vague wonderings, you know, it was maunderings. Uh, well, here we are, right? So I have to sort of put that there as, yeah, I actually wondered about that a couple of years ago. And here we are. So, because uh, he strikes me in, uh, in the interviews and stuff that I've seen or about him or, or where he's talked about stuff, he strikes me as a very adventurous, very independent thinking kind of guy who doesn't want to be under anybody's umbrella. And that's kind of the idea I get with him. Maybe I'm, maybe again, maybe I'm wrong with that. But um, is this a pro-Scientology stream? No, this is not a pro-Scientology no. stream. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just noticed that out of the corner of my eye. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I think Ben was an influence, a positive influence, in drawing her out of that situation. And I think as she herself said, I think motherhood was a huge, you know, awakening, reckoning, she said, 
a reckoning. That's an interesting word to use because that implies, at least for me, a kind of a comeuppance, a real like, oh, my God, I have been a sinner. I have been a bad person. I have been doing things unjust. I have been doing, you know, wrong things. And now I am going to be on the right road. I, I, you know, that's, that's kind of what that translates to me. So yeah, nothing there. I can't find the name of it. They talk about, he was in a child cult, but they don't say the name of it. They say, okay, got it. Good. So I was right that there was a cult involvement in his, yeah, in his past. They compared it to transcendental meditation. Okay. Got it. Something like that. Well, TM is absolutely, I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Transcendental Meditation is a full-blown destructive cult on the order of Scientology. Um, you have celebrity people endorsing TM. If you've heard of TM, Transcendental Meditation, this is the thing the Beatles did back in the 60s with the original, the guy who propagated it as uh, uh, Yogi, whatever his name was. Um, but it's a cult. And, the, and, and they want you to get gradually in more and more and more to the point where they tell you that you can levitate by doing meditation. And through your levitation and through your meditation, uh, L-N-M, yes, meditation and levitation, you will actually change the world and bring about world peace. I'm not kidding. They actually do have dogma that says that. And I know people who were involved in TM at that level who spent all day, every day, sitting wow. around meditating, trying to save the world. So, yeah, so TM's nasty stuff. And uh, if it was TM or something like that, you know, he was probably very neglected as a child. Uh, there's a lot of parental alienation and, and, and uh, neglect that happens uh, when people get to that level of TM because they don't give a shit about their kids anymore. They're just trying to save the world through you know, jumping up and down on mats, uh, levitating while they're, while they're meditating. It's very, very strange. Uh, okay. So, oh yeah. So it looks like we got a new person in the uh, chat yeah. here. Yeah. I'm an SP. Yeah. I said levitate and meditate <laughs> both. <laughs> you meditate in order to levitate off the ground. And what and if you t if you google this you can find video of people jumping up and down uh, you know from a seated position from a yeah. cross-legged position <laughs> uh, while they're meditating and this is supposed to be the levitation part. It's damaging to their bodies to do this. I bet. It's not a good idea and it, it leads you to crazy crazy mental places. So please yeah, hopping around on mats. Please do avoid TM. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's that's my little rant about that. Um, okay, now, by the way, we, we haven't that, seen much of seven. Yes, we will get back. Yes, <laughs> let us do seven actually right now. Boom, there he is again, our little OT7. Oh, look at him soaking up the Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a little cutie. You got a really good shot of him here. Thank you. Yeah, that was really good. Some good seven cam. Yeah. Aw. All right. Our little bundle of furry joy. <laughs> and uh, I, as I will always say every week, we put him on there. Hashtag seven the wonder cat. Someday I will get that trending. Uh, okay. So, excuse me. Excuse me. God, I'm so gross. Um, okay, so that's pretty much, you know, as far as Laura goes, we really need somebody who knows about Scientology to interview or contact her. I have no idea if anybody is in touch with her. Nobody's telling me anything. It would be awesome if Leah Remini did the interview of her. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's kind of what I'm saying right now is wouldn't that be awesome? Um I don't know if I don't, you know, you get when you get a one liner or a two liner like like what Laura did, you get the idea that maybe there's not um, a lot of of willingness to upset the apple cart, start talking about this openly, become the ex Scientologist in the in the media. You know, that's very clearly what Leah has done and good on her for doing it. Absolutely. I support her a thousand percent. Um Laura might not want to go in that direction. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, there's and, – and I I am of two personalities on this one uh, because I – from the activist, anti-Scientology, anti-cult, you know, uh, content creator person, uh, I, I, want her, I want to know the whole story and I want right, to know it now, right? right? Darn it. 
Yeah, I want to know what the hell's up, right? Um, but she is friends with other people who are also probably fence-sitting or under the radar or, you know, are only remaining Scientologists because they don't want to get disconnected or whatever. Well, I don't know if she's still friends with them at this point, but maybe. She still cares about them. I'm maybe. Sure. You know, if you're under the radar as a Scientologist, if you're not doing services, okay, let's say you're a celebrity. Let's say you're some other celebrity, and you're not really fully on board with Scientology, but you're not publicly saying, I'm not doing it, and you're not telling your family and friends, I'm not doing it, because they're hardcore Scientologists, and you like them, and you want to stay friends with them or family with them. And now, here's another one of your friends who's been fence sitting and decides, you know, I'm done with this. And they go and they get out like Laura did. And while they're not saying anything publicly, you get to still be friends with them. You get to still be, you know, because nobody's saying anything. So we're all just kind of happily, quietly not doing Scientology, right? But now she has to go and say this. And that could become problematic for those other connections, those other people, right? So how much more she's willing to say might rely on stuff like that. Well, and it might not be a moral issue where we get to judge her for not being Leah. Well, and it could be a trauma thing too. I mean, everybody deals with what they went through differently. And some people want to shout it from the rooftops and other people are like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's the other hat that I have, right? Mm -hmm. Is is from the academic, from the more understanding you know, of what extremism and cults and, and what coercive control does to you and how it is traumatizing. It, it's traumatizing. And I don't use that word loosely, right? It creates trauma. And trauma is not just you're a little upset. Trauma is not just I had a bad day. I, I am now learning very intimately that trauma is a much stronger thing than that. And, um, and you need to deal with that. Now, it's going to depend a great deal, though, on what your experience with Scientology was. And as a celebrity VIP, she's going to be red carpeted. She's not going to be given all the, the nonsense that your run-of-the-mill Scientologist experiences. Mm -hmm. She certainly wasn't going to experience the same level of abuses that Sea Org members did. And she didn't, while a church member in the church that we know of, she didn't make waves come out publicly, make a big stink, right? And she didn't, you know, do what Leah did, where she starts questioning openly what's going on and David Miscavige's authority. She didn't do that, at least not that we know of. Right. So it looks like she was able to just sort of slide out of it. Based on the data we have right now, it looks like that's what she did. Good on her, but it doesn't necessarily make her or put her in a headspace where she feels compelled to have to speak up about the injustices of Scientology because maybe she didn't particularly see a whole lot of those. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to assume she knows all about Masterson. I don't, I don't know what to think about that. And I'm trying to, you know, practice what I preach here <laughs> where I'm not going to dive into a bunch of, of assumptions about her and then judge her for that. Yeah, I, That's not a good thing for any of us to do. You know, when somebody is just coming out or just making it known, hey, five years ago, I decided to leave and now I'm not practicing anymore and now I'm not doing it. You know, the last thing they need is a whole heap of judgment placed on their head about it. You put too much on there and they could run back to the cult. Because the cult will welcome them back with open arms. Oh, come right back in. Of course, we know you strayed, but we'll welcome you back. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and and now you're back in the fold. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be aware that that's a potential consequence of of coming down on somebody too hard when they come out. You know, oh, you're a, you. Oh God, I was waiting for you to come out so I could tell you what a stupid idiot you were the whole time. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was a stupid idiot this whole time? You know, yeah, like, like, yeah, like all kinds yeah. of, you know, you don't want to be doing that, right? So so from that perspective, I look at her and I go, has she had any counseling? Do you know, does she need some therapy? What What's, you know, what, what does she need as an individual? And maybe that's more important than her speaking out it's 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 this uh, you know and and lacking information we don't know right 
So I'll fall on the side she of caution. She may not know anything about Danny Masterson because creepy people can hide that they're creepy. <laughs> That's true. You know? That's true. He may not have shown that side around her, you know? Exactly. We, d we just don't know. Yeah. So, um... So that's that's you know that's kind of where we're at with this thing right now. I wish I had more solid answers. You know, I, I I feel I've given some conjecture on this as best I can, without you know crossing lines or going into a place where I'm gonna end up you know putting my foot in my mouth. Um, it could have been very easy for her to leave. It could have been no big deal, right? And she was just done. And that's it. And I'm moving on. And she's created a whole different life for herself now. I mean, you see from 2016 forward, she goes into a creative whirlwind. I mean, she's just the cooking and the this and the that. She writes a book about mother. I mean, she's she's really on a roll. So more power to her. I, I, I want to encourage her in that, right? But I do know that um, it would make... If, if she is capable of, and if she is up to speaking out about this, and, she, and I think she is, I, I, I'm, a, I'm sort of assuming that she is, then I really think she should tell the whole story. I think that that would be very, very helpful to, um, to you know, sort of give all of us a little bit of like, oh, that's what happened. But also for that would make a difference to existing Scientologists who might hear about this and go, oh, I need to get out too. She could have that effect as a celebrity. She's got, you know, something like 3 million followers on Instagram. I mean, wow. she's, she's, yeah, she's not a small time celebrity. So it would be a, a real public service that she's in a position where she could do some real good. And I hope, regardless of anything else, regardless of what she knows or doesn't know or whatever, I really, really hope that that opportunity happens and that she that we get the rest of it so uh yeah she'd be the star witness at masterson's trial exactly like that would be amazing right that kind of thing like that would be awesome so you know that's also the kind of thing that would upset her life that would cause scientology to start doing to her what they have been doing to Leah and Mike all these years yep. stalking harassing private investigators death threats I mean all the crap that Leah has piled on her life on a daily basis because of the choices she made in speaking out about Scientology would now be visited on Laura and Ben if they decided to go further with this. And they might just be like completely uninterested in having mm -hmm. any of that nonsense happening in their life. They are extremely, I mean, Laura, in interview after interview, she is all about her family and all about her kids. And it would be, I think, understandable, maybe not something I readily agree with, but I do understand why somebody would put their family and their children's safety above speaking out publicly about a group they haven't, you know, that they don't really care that much about anymore. So what are we to think about all this? We need more data. We need more information to, yeah. to know for sure. It's good news. It's it's great news. I'm very, very happy that she did speak out the way she did. Wouldn't it be awesome if Michael Pena were to speak out? Yeah, come it, on. Right? If some other, Pena. Exactly. <laughs> if some other Scientologist celebs were to go, oh, yeah, well, I haven't been doing it either. <laughs> right? I mean, yes, that would be amazing, right? I would love to see... You know, Beck sort of did the same kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, just a and, little, just a little blah. You know, and Leah called him a coward because you know he he didn't really speak up and say much of anything else. And I get it. I get where she's coming from. You know, it is righteous and it is justified to be pissed at these guys. There is that side of it too, and I will say I get that. You know, it's not like I don't understand where those emotions come from. You know, I can be just as pissed at Beck as Leah is, but you know, I, I don't know uh, if it's if it's for for me, it's not it, it's not a good thing for me to to go in that place. So, so I don't do that. But um, but yeah, it would be great if some other if some other people in this circle or other Scientologists, uh, you know, who are no longer Scientologists would would speak up about this. So so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think we have come to running out of time here. Yes, yes. 
So I guess we're going to wrap up. If there were any other um, important questions or anything I missed in the chat. Well, everybody wants you to interview her once she starts talking. If yeah. she starts talking. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> like she would have a, a moment of time for somebody like me. I, I, don't, I, I severely doubt that is what's going to, well, going to happen. Well, Leah was on your show. And... That's true. Leah was on my show. Maybe I should shut up. But I, I just don't. Yeah, I don't. I, I reach out to a lot of people, you guys, um, to get them to come on my show and do interviews and stuff. And, and most of the time, I just get crickets back. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's just... <laughs> but I'll keep trying. Uh, okay, let us check in one last time with our seven cam. Because three times are the charm for that. And there's our little guy just sleeping away. Uh, He's pretty. Yes, he is. Our little OT7. All right. And um, yeah, I, I do think that it would be an awesome interview. Don't get me wrong. I would I would uh, not give body parts, but I would definitely, uh, you know, jump through some hoops in order to get somebody like Laura Preppin on my show. That would be absolutely awesome if I could if I could arrange to talk to her. And and yeah, she should talk to me. Yeah, <laughs> I have some things to tell her that that she should hear. So that would be uh, that would be good. So we are now going to end off the show. We're going to do our critical thinking cards because how could we do a critical conversations without doing a critical thinking card? All right, what do we got? Declinism. Ooh, decline declinism or declinism, De like declinism. Yeah. yeah. You remember the past as better than it was and expect the future to be worse than evidence suggests it will be. Yeah. We never experienced this in this household. Never. <laughs> and and old people definitely never experienced No. This old people never experienced declinism. <laughs> Despite living in the most peaceful and prosperous time in history, many people believe things are getting worse. All you got to do to see this logical fallacy or, uh, yeah, cognitive bias is get on Twitter for a day. <laughs> you oh are going to see yeah, more yeah, examples yeah. of this than you can shake a stick at. Use metrics such as life expectancy, levels of crime and violence, and prosperity statistics. And you will definitely see that the world is becoming a better place. Um, so, declinism. Stop doing it. Yeah. There's a book <laughs> called The Way We Never Were. It's pretty great. I read it a few years ago, and it's about that whole idea that we think a lot of people think, oh, you know, the 50s were so great or the 40s or whatever, or the 1890s. And no, <laughs> they're not better than now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Our, uh, isn't it shocking when you get when you get a moment in your life where it is proven to you beyond any shadow of a doubt, beyond any question that you have grossly misremembered something that you were positive you remembered correctly a tv show something in school you know movie whatever i mean it, you know the, it, we can prove it with entertainment because you can always go back and watch the movie or see yeah, the thing yeah. again right but and that and and this has happened to me a couple of times where i was absolutely positive i was remembering a scene Color by color, word for word, <laughs> every bit perfect. I mean, it's played in my mind 30, 40, 50 times over the years, totally certain that I got it. And then I go see it again or read it again or hear about it again. And I was way off. Mm -hmm. I mean, way off. And I would have sworn on a stack of Dianetics books that I absolutely <laughs> was remembering that correctly, right? So, you know, you always got to treat yourself with a little, give yourself a little grain of salt when you're, when you're absolutely sure you remember things the way they were. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> okay, guys. All right. So that is our, uh, our show for this year. Yeah. The golden years of the fifties. That's right. Where they hit all the domestic. Abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, thanks for coming around and watching, guys. Really appreciate your viewership. And thank you very much for the super chats. Loved those. Uh, always yeah. appreciative. 
Um, hope the show was interesting. I know that I really only offered a little bit here in terms of solid answers, but it's kind of my brand that I'm not going to go say shit that I, I don't know is true. You know, I'm really, I, I want to stick with that. And so we, I think we've thrown some good conjecture out there. I think we have some, I, I think we have a very positive thing that's happened this week. And I think that I hope that it gets built upon and we hear more about this. And if we do, I will definitely tell you guys all about it because this is something I'll be keeping my ear to the to the ground about. So uh, we all good? Yeah. Excellent. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and wrap up. All right. All righty then. Boom. <laughs>